Acts 3, 25 and 26 reads, And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers, he said to Abraham. Through your offspring, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Let us pray. Lord, we just, uh, we again, we thank you for the, for the beautiful day today. Thank you for this body of believers and the physical church and, and your church outside these walls, Lord. I ask you to make your presence known here, calm our minds, help us to just study and meditate on your word and, uh, and uh, worship you with all our heart today. And, uh, as always, I want to ask you to uh, lift up Brother Furlan for his message and, uh, and we ask, pray that everything, again, that he says be focused through the lens of Scripture. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hemp Wilson. Turn to page 255. M255. Afterwards. And I look upon his face 
the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day for a that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day! First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who's been praying for Linda. Uh, most of you know that she was in the hospital this past week. It's been a hard week. Um, as already mentioned about Ray, who went on to be with the Lord, and Lori, and the family are still grieving. And, and Linda was having a hard time. She was in the hospital since last Sunday through Wednesday. And uh, she had a lot of fluid build up around her lungs. I drained all that off, and we're waiting for the results from that. But, but I just appreciate everybody's prayers for her throughout the week. I kept getting texts and people coming to visit, and, and it was just a wonderful thing. And I, I thank you all so much for that. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this has been a hard week. But we give you the glory and the praise for the, for the outcomes of everything that's happened. We pray especially for Ray's family. Lori and the kids and the grandkids and all the, all the family that's there with them. We thank you that you will fill their hearts and that empty space in their hearts and their lives the way that only you can with, the, with your Holy Spirit and the love and the peace and the warmth of your presence to be in that empty space that they're dealing with and the grief that they're feeling. Just give them peace and a calmness and strength to continue on. Father, we give you all the glory and the praise for all the just all the miraculous things you've done this week. We thank you. We pray for all those things that we mentioned in Sunday school this morning. And we just pray for each member that's sitting here today. Bless each family and each person that's here special way and help us to give you all the glory and the praise for us. And we worship you, Father. And we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mercy and his glory. Mm Yeah. 
over in your bulletins, a couple pages. The next song, the Lord is my salvation. Is he your salvation today? Amen. Genesis today, will be, our text will be chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, a little review from last Sunday, we had a, a war take place, it was a rebellion, we had four kings against five kings, we had Sodom and Gomorrah 
fall, the kings left, the conquering kings took everything, and in that they captured Lot and all his possessions. And Abram had to come and rescue Lot. This week, we're getting into 15, and we'll unpack this, and there is a lot here for us. We have in this text today a lot of assurance that we can hold from this for ourselves. So let's go ahead and read the text, and then let's dig into it. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is El Elizar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Gal of the Galatians to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Persizzites, and the Rephaims the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Gergashites, and the Jebusites. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Verse 1 starts off with, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Let's just think about that. God of creation is telling Abram, I am your shield. Fear not. If God is our shield, then we think of shield, we think of defense. We think of protection. That's what a shield does. It protects. And we find in, in Proverbs 35, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So we have God as a shield. This should, just that in itself, 
I mean, when we think shield, we automatically think of physical more than we do anything, of physical protection. But in this here, the shield that we have is more it's on the spiritual side because our souls are way more important than our physical bodies. <coughs> or remember, we're, we're not kingdom, we're not uh, residents here. We're residents of heaven. So we, it's our souls that go. And then after Christ comes and returns, we are given new bodies. But our soul, he is the protector of our souls. So this should, this should actually give us great boldness in how we proceed. God is our shield. So he's telling Abram not to fear. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. And then he starts going into more of this covenantal language and stuff, what he's telling Abram he's going to do for him. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Elizer of Damascus. And Abram, Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Abram's doing something that we all do on a regular basis. We don't see the results of something that we're told we're going to get. We don't see it right away. So we're starting to, okay, where is it? <laughs> You're saying all this, God, but, you know, I don't have any heirs. I don't have any kids of my own. So I've got people. So it's he's of my house, so maybe this is the way it's going to be. But we do this. We pray for something. We say, God, help me do this. And we read the scripture, and a lot of times we find the answers right here in scripture, but it looks different than the way we picture it or, or whatever. That but is always there. So we try to move ahead, and we try to help God out <laughs> sometimes in our lives. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Verse 4. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look towards the heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And then 6. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. We've seen this before with Noah. He believed the Lord. So this should automatically, with us, we should be asking ourselves, do we believe the Lord? We read texts like this where oh, he's our shield. Do you believe that he is your shield? Because unless we believe these things, we're never going to be able to step in to boldness. Unless we believe that no matter what, whatever God allows to take place is for my good, we're not going to step in to what we're called to. Do you believe the Lord? Whenever we see that in Scripture, it should be a reminder to us to check ourselves. Do we believe the Lord? And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out, verse 7, of your, of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? We do that. How do I know if I'm supposed to go here? How do I know if I'm supposed to go to this church or 
to that church? Am I supposed to work at this job or that, that job? And we pray. And then we start using things of through a worldly view of, well, this one pays this much if it's a job. Or this one only pays this much. This one has this benefits. This one has, you guys get it, so on and so on. And that's what we use to determine, well, God must be wanting me to go there because it's got better retirement or better benefits. But we don't wait and see what God actually wants to tell us where to go. And if we believe God and we're man, men and women of God and we're trying to follow God, and this, is the, this is the hard part that we have to continually grow in. Every aspect of our life has to be transformed and to we view everything through the lens of the scriptures of what God has told us. We can't just say, well, this one I'll view, but this one here I'm going to view through the worldly lens. Now, well, this one here I'll view through scripture, but this one here I'll view through worldly. You can see the conflicts and the problems that's going to arise through that. Well, this is what Abram is demonstrating. He's saying, how am I supposed to know? And what's interesting, look what happens in 9. He said to him, this is God speaking to him, he said, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought them all these, cut them in half, and he laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. So Abram would have known exactly what's getting ready to happen, for sure. So he's telling him to bring these things, and he cuts them in half. And the significance of cutting them in half would be with this covenant digital, excuse me, with this covenant digital thing that's taking place, they would cut it in half, and then both parties that's making this promise to each other or this agreement to each other would then walk in amongst and between the two halves of whatever was being sacrificed or used for this covenant. And this signified that if one of them broke the promise to the other, this is what's going to happen. So he would have understood this. So, okay. He's, making, he's getting ready to make a promise. We're getting ready to make a promise and agreement to him. But then it kind of changes. And then we see in 11, actually it says, And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Let's, we'll come back to that. Let's remember that. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell. This is 12 on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And here's something that's very important for us to see. Abram didn't need to walk in between and amongst the cut pieces of the sacrifice. Because this covenant is actually from God to Abram. This is not an agreement between the two where Abram got to do this and then God does this. This is a covenant from God to Abram. So he's not having to step into this and say, I promise to do X or whatever it may be. This is all from God to him. Important that we see that because what's this also tell us? It should give us great assurance whenever we see this type of covenant because it's held together completely and totally by God. It's not dependent on anything that Abram could do at all. This is God promising him. He's going to make his offspring as numerous as the stars, as the sand on the, on the beaches, as the dust, these different things that he's using to describe the offspring. 
Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. We see part of this, the end of this very thing, in Exodus 12, 40. Exodus 12, starting in verse 40 and 41, where it says, The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Well, we know this is where Moses led the people out of Egypt. And then, so this is, it's being foretold here, what's going to happen. There's, there's, there's even more hope there for us. We're seeing what God says is going to happen. We see it take place. We have that benefit of God's word that we can look at and see. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out in great possessions. 15. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. So he's blessing him. Let him know he's going to live for, to an old age. He's going to go to his fathers to be buried at an old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. We see the providence and the sovereignty of God. Nothing is outside of his control or his will. Their rights, their iniquity isn't, isn't finished yet. My people, the Hebrews, the ones that are in captivity for 400 years, they have to be there to get to a point to where I can be their God and bring them out. Sometimes God allows us to be captive or go through things. And it's for our good so that we turn to him and we praise him. Anything that happens in our lives that makes us turn to God is a good, good thing. Amen? No matter what it is, no matter what kind of suffering that God may allow us to go through, what captivity we are in, if it turns us to God, it is good. We have to continually remind ourselves of these things because it's easy to forget in the midst of whatever we're going through. It's easy to forget well, with like Miss Lori right now. I'm sure she's, she's oh this is horrible and it is. I'm not questioning, I'm not making, putting down on that when we lose a loved one. It is a heartbreaking hard thing. We have and we can rest assured that God is in control of these situations. We can praise him through it and through this very praise and the worship of God through these hard times. We can find comfort and peace because our hope is in the shield that he is to us when we take refuge in him. We can't separate ourselves from the scriptures. We have to immerse ourselves in the scriptures to find these comforts, these promises, and these truths. 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. So this smoking fire pot and this, the, the fire the, the torch, the flaming torch this is signifying the presence of God he is coming down and making the covenant with God we see this very thing this is why this should be such an assurance text for us with God to us with the covenant with his son that remember if we go all the way back to Genesis 3 and he tells 
the woman's offspring, the woman, this, all through this, will be the one that crushes the serpent's head. And then we follow it through Noah, through the lineage of the seed. We'll follow the seed through Noah, now Abram, choosing the people, and eventually to David, to Christ, and this covenant that we have that has nothing to do with us. It's all God. It's God's love for us that he made this covenant because there's nothing we can do. There's no way that we can fulfill our end of a, of a covenant. We can't keep the law. We can't be pure. We can't attain a certain status. There's nothing we can do. But God makes the covenant with his son saying, here's my son. He can do it. So the agreement is that his son will pay the price that we can't pay. His son will be the sacrifice that is accepted by God. And because we have no part in that, we have the assurance that it's held together by God. That should be a thing to rejoice in that very thing that God has done with his son for our salvation. We have our shield, our hope. We have everything and a total package done at the cross. And it's in God's providence the way this is working coming up on Easter that we're in this text. And then next week is Palm Sunday. And then the week after that, Easter, the very we celebrate where Christ is raised from the dead, from, from dying on the cross for the very covenant that God made to save his people. The promise that he made in, in Genesis 3. We're seeing it fulfilled. We should be shouting it. We should be rejoicing in it. We should find such comfort and assurance in this. And then we have loved ones that go, that know the Lord, that go before us. We know they're sleeping. We're going to see them again when we're at the feet of Christ and we're all worshiping and celebrating Him because we have the assurance of what He did and that He keeps it. Amen? Yes. We should be excited about this. And we should be, when we're out there, we, it should be just boiling off of us when we see people and we see them struggling with the things of this world. The hardships and they don't have any hope they don't have any way to get out of it. They're brought up in broken homes. They're broke, being brought up in a broken nation. Sin is everywhere. It rules their lives. There's no hope. Yet we're walking around with the assurance and the good news and the hope that we have that God has made a covenant with His people that he will save us through his son. We believe and we repent and we say that we need him. And we believe what he tells us. And then we step into it. It's all him. It's his glory. Everything that he does is to magnify his name. That's what his son does. By by stepping into this covenant with his Father for us. And then we're given to Christ. And Christ tells us that, or he tells us, Father, everyone that you have given me, I have not lost one. Amen? Amen. And that should be joyous. <laughs> not lost one. And when you think about that shield and that security that we have, because we are in Christ. And Christ is in God. What have we got to worry about? Do I ever think at any time that I am strong enough, more powerful enough, or I can do anything to mess up enough 
to get myself out of what Christ has done for me. And sometimes though we walk around that way, I've messed up. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how God can love me. I'm pitiful. Well, yes, you are. But God died for you. Christ died for you. So you have worth in Christ. He chose you while you were yet a sinner. He lifted you up. He, he, he made this beautiful salvation that he brings us to himself. That we can be bold because he is shielding us. And we go out in this world and we see what's happening. Yet we walk like this. Oh, it's me. My life is so horrible. Is that the way we're supposed to be demonstrating Christ? No. We have the good news. We have what everybody out there needs. And he tells us to what? To tell them. And if we want to be men and women of God, like Abram, like Noah, these examples, I believe the Lord. So Noah believed the Lord. And what did he do? He built an ark. Are we going out and building an ark? Or are we panicking with the rest of the world because the flood's coming? I can't do this for you. This is something individually that you have to, this is a relationship, a personal relationship between you and Christ. You've seen what he's done. You've heard the glorious gospel. You respond to it or you don't. It's either life or it's death to your ears. If you've stepped into it and you say it's life, are you manifesting fruits that demonstrate this? Are you walking in a way that says, I believe the Lord? We do this with our life. We, we, we have ups and downs. We fell. We're sinful people, just like God's people. He's made this covenant that are coming out of Abram. This, this, this Jewish people most of the time seemed like they were in captivity they were turning from God God would save them and they would turn God saves them and they turn back to the idols God saves them and they turn back to worshiping false gods it's just back and forth yet we're the same we're not the heroes of the Bible we're the ones that are sinning that are turning this is what it, we see this picture because we can't do it without Christ, without God. That's what this shows us. But we have a shield. We have hope. We have assurance. And praise God is not based on anything that I can do or can't do. Or you can do or can't do. It's in Christ, in the covenant. So we see this beautiful covenant that's being made. And we're seeing it worked out. And we're seeing how God, okay, I'm making this covenant. Abram, I don't need you. Go to sleep. Let me do my thing. And he does it. He comes to you. He moves between the pieces of cut me. He makes the promise. And what Abram does, his only part Remember I said we'd come back to 11? Verse 11. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. This promise of our salvation through what Christ has done. Our part, other than believing and stepping into it, is we're defending the faith and the covenant that God has made. Just like Abram here. He's defending, keeping the birds. He's not sure what's going on. Just doing what, what God told him to do. Well, well, I know 
You shouldn't be coming down here and eating this stuff. These birds should so let me defend it. So we have this the world attacking the gospel and our foundations of our beliefs. We, we all should be saying, oh, no, 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 wait a no, 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 no. This is the covenant my God made with me. I stand firm. No matter the consequences, I defend it. We stand on it. We shout it. We sing the songs about it. We read the word about it. We come to church and we tell each other about it. But are we telling the ones that actually need it about it? Are we reflecting it? We have just in this room, some are still working, some still have, uh, you have dojo, kids, influence. You have family members that aren't saved. You have people that you run into in the stores. God brings our ministry to us every day. And we need to be ready, be bold, because we are shielded in God to do the very things that he called us to do. We have the security. So the question is, why aren't we? Why aren't we? Well, we're worried about things like, well, maybe we are, maybe we are, hopefully we're not. How many people can we get in this building? God will build his church regardless of me or you. We're faithful. You know how God builds his church? By us being faithful, doing what he's called us to do. Going out there and telling people about the good news. That's how God builds his church. We're given that example all through scripture. And God multiplied them. God added to their numbers daily. God, God. Not Paul, not John, not Peter. God added to their numbers. We're, we're not called to add to the numbers. We're called to be faithful in what he told us to do. Let's tell the good news. Let's be faithful. Let's, let's be like Abram here. He believed the Lord. And then he went and got the stuff to prepare for the sacrifice, for the covenant. We have it. We have the covenant already. We've been told what to do. I, for one, say I believe. So let's tell the good news what we're called to. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our hands. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for who you are and what you've done. We glorify you in all things. Dear Lord, we just pray for strengthening, for wisdom, for boldness. Dear Lord, we pray that we step into this assurance that we have in you. Dear Lord, that it's you and you alone that holds our salvation. Dear Lord, may we rejoice greatly in that fact. Dear Lord, I just pray that the Spirit move in each one of us in such a mighty way that we can't help but tell others the good news, that it boils up from us in all of our conversations. Dear Lord, may we represent you well. May our actions demonstrate that we are yours, that we are not of this world. Dear Lord, may we be an intentional people that seek out to bring you glory in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we'll stand in closing.